that regardless of race or background or wealth or career or training, all men were equal. I wonder sometimes how much we believe that idea. Because the reality is we rarely treat people with equality. And even when we think we do, we still fail. You ever heard of the city of Osceola, Missouri? I hope I'm saying that right. I'm not from Missouri. But did you know that that city cannot stand the state of Kansas? In the years leading up to the Civil War, there was some skirmishes between these two slate states over slavery. The battles were known as, the, as Bleeding Kansas. The Kansas Jayhawkers against the Missouri Border Ruffians, where they fought over and over and over again. One of those attacks occurred in 1861 where the Jayhawkers came to Osceola, Missouri and looted and burned the town. It was this incident that inspired the Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales, by the way. And eventually the war occurred and ended this conflict, but the town of Osceola did not let go of their bitter hatred for Kansas. Prior to those raids, it was a town of 2,500, and after the attack, there were only 200 people left. And today, to my knowledge, there are only about 1,000 residents there. They have never regained their prominence and their size, and they still blame the Jayhawks for that. In fact, in 2011, the residents of Osceola convinced their city council to pass a resolution demanding that the University of Kansas stop using the symbol of domestic terrorism as their mascot, the Kansas Jayhawk. They also demanded that Missourians should stop selling Kansas merchandise with the capital K because Kansas is, quote, neither a proper name or a proper place. This was over something that happened 150 years earlier. And I use that story to point this out, that if we still fight over something that happened generations before we even came upon the scene, that our great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents were involved with, I tell you what, we're able to carry a lot of grudges with us and a lot of prejudices. And even though a document in 1776 may say that all men are created equal, I think sometimes we still struggle with that. By the way, that statement is not Scripture. Some people think that is a quote from Scripture. It is not. It is a man-made statement, but I believe it is supported by Scripture. In fact, in Acts chapter 10, that seems to be the principle that is explained to Peter there through this vision. Peter falls into a trance in Acts chapter 10, and this sheet is lowered from heaven with all kinds of animals and reptiles and all kinds of birds of the air in verses 10 through 12. And in verse 13, he is told to rise and eat. And in verse 14, he says, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God's response is, what I say is clean is clean. If you want to know what Peter's understanding of that vision was over in Acts chapter 10, look at verses 28 and 29, where he talks to those of the house of Cornelius. He says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit any other nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. God essentially says in that story that all men are created equal. And yet I think sometimes that we still practice what the Bible describes as being respecters of persons. 
So I want to take a look at that this morning. I want to begin by sharing with you five ways I believe we commonly discriminate. The first of those is based on appearance. In fact, James chapter 2 and verses 1 through 7, that is exactly the idea that is introduced by James there. James 2, start with verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, God has not, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? And heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? This whole passage begins with looks. Here's a guy who dresses well. Sit up front. Here's a guy who doesn't dress well. Stand in the back or sit at my feet. We live in a culture that places a lot of emphasis on appearance and looks. Beauty is everything. If you're a cute kid, you've got it made. If you're plain, good luck. And that is something that carries over how people dress. Why are there so many tanning beds and nail salons? Because appearance is important. That's why you pay more for a polo shirt and Nike shoes, because looks matter. If you're going for a job interview, what do we say? The first thing, make sure you dress up. Why? Because we judge based on appearance. And it is common for us to show preferential treatment based on how people dress and how they look. James says, don't do that. The context is obviously the assembly. It says that. Let's be honest for a moment. We have all looked at somebody and repeated the words of that song. Why would you come in here looking like that? And yet that's not what we should do. Let me say one thing about this before we move on. Specifically in the area of dress, when it comes to a church, this seems to be sometimes a popular discussion. Some people like to dress up. Some people like to wear suits and ties and nice dresses. And I have no problem with that. I'm kind of fond of a good tie and a nice pair of shoes. Ask my wife. Got lots of those. There are others who are more casual. They'd rather come in maybe a pair of khakis or jeans and a decent, nice buttoned-up shirt and their best pair of cowboy boots. The reality is that both are okay as long as they're not drawing attention to themselves for all the wrong reasons. But I want to tell you what shouldn't happen on either side of that issue is judging people based on how they dress. Assuming that somebody that doesn't wear a tie isn't very spiritual. Or assuming that the guy who does wear a tie doesn't care about other people. Both statements I've heard from folks before. That's exactly what James is condemning here. And we need to be careful that we're not guilty of those things. Secondly, we could judge based on ancestry. There's a story that was told one time of two apples hanging on a tree. They looked down at the world below them and they said, look at all those people fighting and robbing and rioting. No one seems to get along with this fellow man. Someday, only us apples will be left and we will rule the world. And the second apple looked at him and said, which ones, the red ones or the green ones? Ancestry has always been a problem. Acts chapter 6, that's exactly what's going on. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, there arises a dispute, a complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in their daily distribution. It's interesting here that the writer makes sure that we know that ancestry, heritage, has a part in this problem. And while it was resolved, it was kept in mind even in that idea of how it was resolved. Did you realize seven Greek men were chosen to oversee the task? In Acts chapter 6. 
And Acts chapter 10 is the lineage of the ancestries of Cornelius and Peter that made it unlawful for them to eat together. And so it's interesting in that sense that Peter here is a Jew. He's a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Cornelius is not a Jew. He is a Gentile. They are not supposed to associate with one another. And yet in Acts chapter 10 is that moment where the Gentiles are offered the gospel. What does Peter have to do in chapter 11? Defend that to a group of Jews. Because ancestry was an issue. In Galatians chapter 2 and verses 11 through 14, we even see there that Peter, who was the first to convert a non-Jew, even then struggled as he was pulled away in hypocrisy and would not associate with the Gentiles in the presence of other Jews. Ancestry has always been an issue. And it still is. And I have to tell you something. The reality is that when it comes to ethnicity and race and colors of skin and all of those things and different kinds of dialects or languages, while we may have come a long way as people, we still have further to go. Don't give in to the idea that part of all of us being equal is we have to be the same. That's not what equality is in that sense. Another form of discrimination is age. One that perhaps we don't think of very often, but it is a form of discrimination, the age gap. Young people look at us older people, and now I'm one of those old folks, unfortunately, as old and out of touch. We don't get it. We need to get with the times. We look at you as being impulsive and immature and downright silly most of the time. And yet that shouldn't be a problem. First Timothy 4 and verse 12, Paul told Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. There's a responsibility that, that he gave Timothy to make sure he was of such a standard of character that somebody would not look down upon him because of his age. But there's also an implication there greater than just making sure young people live up to a standard. There's also, I think, an implication to us older folks that we should not be looking for reasons to look down upon those young folks. In fact, I would suggest to you that in many cases, when you look down on a young person who's a brother or sister in Christ and you feel like they are not meeting that standard of character, well, you're partly to blame for not helping them as the older brother, according to Titus 2, or sister who's supposed to help train them up in those ways. We should not let age gaps be a problem. What if Moses had never had a younger Joshua? What if Elijah had not taken on the younger Elisha? What if Paul had never taught a Timothy or a Titus? All of those stories are of older men taking in younger men and mentoring them. Not discriminating. There's also achievement. Luke 18, 10 through 14 is that story we know so well of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee who stands and prays, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven and beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What was the problem here? Both men were Jews. There was nothing about the appearance or the ancestry or even the age of the tax collector that probably should have caused any discrimination between this Pharisee and him. And yet the difference was that the Pharisee had accomplished, at least in his mind, so much more and so much better. Paul described himself as a Pharisee as being a Jew of the Jews in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. And on the other hand, the tax collector had achieved nothing among his peers. In fact, he was viewed as a sellout and a loser, somebody who'd gone to the other side. And that is how they viewed tax collectors. Sometimes if we're not careful, we get into the idea that our culture does that we celebrate winners and we turn our back on losers. 
And you can quickly switch between those two, by the way. One minute you can be a hero, and the next you can be a zero in the eyes of somebody. Don't judge one another based on achievements. And then back to James 2 is the matter of affluence or wealth. That not only was it their appearance, but it had to do, as James said, with their wealth, with what they had. The rich man versus the poor man. There is a scene that James is vividly painting for us there. There are these two people that come in, for instance, a couple comes into the assembly. Both are wearing jeans and flip-flops. The man has an earring. The woman's makeup looks different than what we typically would see. They both have visible tattoos. We see them come in. What do we do? Do we greet them? Do we talk to them? Or do we watch them come in and ask the person next to us, who is that? Where did they come from? How did they find out about us? Another family comes in that are an attractive, normal couple. He's wearing a nicely pressed pair of khakis and a tie, and she's in a attractive, fashionable, modest dress. The two little girls are in their matching monogrammed outfits. But I tell you what happens when they walk in. We smother them to death. We usher their kids to class. We try to find out everything we can because after all, as one person once told me, not here but another place, that's the kind of people we need here. That is exactly what James is condemning in James 2, 1 through 7. And by the way, what I just said sounds terrible, and it is. It is horrible. And by the way, it is also sinful. It's discrimination. And it shouldn't exist. Let me share with you three problems with discrimination. We're going to find all these in James 2. If you're not there already, you need to be in James 2. And let's see three things that are problems with this. Number one, it is unchristian. It is unchristian. In verses one through four, notice there, for if a man, verse two, if a man wearing a gold ring, fine clothing comes into your assembly, poor man in shabby clothing comes in, you have paid attention to the one in fine clothing, say, sit here in a good place. Why you say the poor man stand over there, sit at my feet? Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Skip down to verse nine. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. What does James say about this? In verse 4, when you do this, it is evil. Verse 9, it is sin. It is a transgression of the law. Why? Because Jesus was sent to die for everyone, John 3.16 says. And just so you understand, that includes the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the English speaking, the Spanish speaking, the educated, the uneducated, the good looking, the ugly, the fat, the skinny, the male, the female, the educated, the uneducated. Everybody is in there. And if we're truly going to reflect Christ, then we must treat all of them the same. And one of the greatest examples of the way he treated people like that is actually the apostles. Because in that group, there is a collection of, quite frankly, underachieving, somewhat uneducated and unwealthy men. You have four struggling fishermen, a political activist, and a sellout tax collector among the twelve. And yet he used all of them to turn the world upside down. I'm going to tell you something. This is the truth. There's enough discrimination in the world already. The one place it cannot exist is among God's people. They will find that everywhere else. Among God's own, they should find what it really means to be equal. It is also unreasonable. In verses 5 through 7, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him, but you've dishonored the poor. Are not the rich ones who oppress you the ones who drag you into court? Are they not ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Now, you got to keep this in context. I don't know that any rich people have drugged me into court before. I've never been drugged to court. 
But the point here was for them specifically that they were honoring the people who were mistreating them. Please understand, James is not saying that it is good to be poor and it is bad to be rich. That is not the point of this text. He is saying that God doesn't look at you through your bank account. I mean, i got to tell you, I for one am glad that my salvation is not dependent on my financial history. It's unreasonable to judge people that way. Don't judge people in a way that their wealth is how much they are actually worth. James's point is these are the people who are actually oppressing you. You know, sometimes we get closer to some people, especially the affluent and successful, for selfish motives. We think they're going to help us, make us better. Maybe we can get on their good side. Maybe we can reverse our fortune by being friends with them. That's not how that works. But James says, don't show favoritism. It's unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. Now, warning. Don't take passages like this and forget the wealthy when it comes to the gospel. Don't be extremist. Because that would be unreasonable as well. The point is not to look at wealth at all. Thirdly, it is unloving. Look at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Showing favoritism violates what we often call the golden rule. Over and over again, we are told that the law was summed up in two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John 4, 20 and 21 tells us there, that if you cannot love your brother and say you love God, that you are a liar. I've heard people say, well, I can love them, but that doesn't mean I have to like them. I'm just going to say this in response. I wonder sometimes how God really feels about that. Perhaps what we need to do is understand how to overcome what we don't like so we can truly love them. Let me share with you as we close three ways I think that we can show equality. Three ways that we can show equality, how we can do this. Number one, accept everybody. Do you like snobby people? I think the answer is usually no to that. It's not a very attractive quality. At all. What did Paul tell the church in Rome? In Romans 15 and verse 7, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. There it says in the common English version, I like a little better, Honor God by accepting each other as Christ has accepted you. We should accept everybody. Not look down on folks, but accept everybody. Now that doesn't mean that we can tolerate evil. That we can cut corners doctrinally to accept folks. That's not what that means. It simply means that we embrace people who are different than we are. <coughs> you know, Charlie here and I, we got this little Alabama-Tennessee thing going. <laughs> that's a kind of a joke for us. And the reason I say that's a joke and not serious is because, you know, my goal is for me and Charlie to both be in heaven. And in the end, where we're from, which team we root for, none of that's going to matter, is it? And it'd be silly for Charlie and I to be really divided over that. Isn't it just as silly to be divided over what you wear or what color your skin is or how much you have? What candidate you support. All those things that we see people divide over. You've heard it said before, but look, if we can't get along here about things like that, what makes us think we want to spend eternity together? Accept everybody. Secondly, appreciate everybody, which is a step further. 
Philippians 2, 3, and 4 is such a revolutionary statement. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. The idea there is not just knowing each other, accepting each other, but appreciating what each other's ideas and thoughts are. You ever thought about what this congregation would be like if we weren't different? What if we were all the same? How boring would that be, by the way? If we all drove the same car, wouldn't that be weird? We all lived in the same part of town or wore the same clothes. You know what part of makes the body so amazing is that we do come from such different places and backgrounds and understandings. And yet we become one through Christ. Despite all of that. Never use those things, those differences that may be out there as a way to look down, but use them as a way to appreciate. And finally, affirm everybody. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another, build one another up just as you are doing. Be an encourager, be a builder. People find enough negativity in tearing down in life without us adding to that. After all, what's the point of us being here, according to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, to motivate one another to love and to encourage one another as the day approaches? Part of that is through our worship. I don't know about you, but I have been extremely encouraged this morning. The singing has been fantastic. The thoughts around the table were so motivating John's prayer, I got to admit, when he took the mic and sat down, I wondered how long he was going to be there. But it was fantastic. <laughs> but the other part that we get is just by being in each other's presence. And loving each other and affirming each other and encouraging one another. I think if we do these things that we can be closer to treating everybody with equality. I will admit to you that it will always be a struggle to do that perfectly. But this section in James 2 was left for us for a reason. It was left for us to warn us and to show us that this is something that we have to not only be aware of, but that we have to take action and work on. We love all men. Just as God loved all of us enough to send his son. That is the great news is that through Jesus Christ, there is this opportunity for all of us, regardless of those differences that may be there, cultural background, ethnicity, any of those things. We can all be brought together as one through Christ Jesus. Because he died not only to save us from our sins, but to then to bring us into God's family as those children in that covenant through the Son. Are you part of that family? Have you accepted that gift that has been extended to you through the death and sacrifice of Jesus Christ? If not, why not? Why not do that this morning? Why not put on Christ? Paul said, as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Why not do that? If you've not, why not do it now? Come while we stand and while we sing this song together.